Okay, good morning, everybody. Let's uh, get started. Uh, again, a quick note just about uh, where we are with assignments. Undergraduates, you're moving on to, uh, if you haven't already, moving on to assignment six, where in six, seven, eight, and nine, you're going to be implementing a series of increasingly powerful search methods. The first one in assignment six is the hill climber, pretty straightforward. Uh, graduate students, you have now hopefully completed assignment 10. How many are able to evolve a robot that approaches two out of the four light sources? Good. Three out of the four light sources? Kind of? Okay. All right. You can work on that. You'll be switching uh, this week and in all remaining weeks up until the exam period to working on your final project. So I'm going to just very briefly talk about this to get the graduate students started, and then we'll talk about more details of the final project for most of you when you get to the final project uh, in about a little over a month's time. Okay, so uh, graduate students, what are you going to be doing this week? If you click on the final project link, it'll take you to a Google Doc which has all the information about the final project. It's got information about the weekly deliverables, which you're going to be delivering weekly until uh, the final exam period, where you will be submitting a written report and an oral presentation. That's for the end of the course. We'll talk about those later if you want. You can read ahead. Let's talk about the weekly deliverables. The idea here is that, as always, you're going to be submitting images and video uh, every week to demonstrate something to us in weekly deliverables, you're demonstrating that you're making weekly progress towards your final project. For the uh, graduate students, I think there are eight weeks left. I could be wrong. We'll, we'll calibrate this as we go. Uh, so you'll be submitting eight weekly reports. The first one is due next Monday at 11.59 p.m. And what you're going to be submitting is a, uh, is, is a spreadsheet which has information about your final project. So we're just looking for a couple of sentences about what you plan to do. And then your plan for the graduate students for the following seven weeks, what are the intermediate steps that'll get you to that final project? This is what you're submitting, graduate students, this is what you're submitting next Monday. So not a lot, but basically we want you to spend some time thinking about what you want to do and how to break that down into seven bite-sized chunks. Okay. Uh, so there's instructions here, step two about how to do this. Um, and then what you're going to be doing, uh, make sure that the spreadsheet is viewable by all. You're just going to be submitting a URL to that points to this uh, link. The idea here is as you then move forward in weekly report two, you're just going to be adding a tab to your spreadsheet, and that tab is going to obviously correspond to weekly report two. So here's my weekly report two, here's what I have in mind, and there's a link to a video demonstrating that I have implemented that piece of functionality. Make sense? So let, let's have a look at an example final project. So this is actually a final project from a previous student. They wanted to create a wegged robot. So this is a robot that doesn't have wheels, doesn't have legs, it has wegs, which are a combination of the two. Uh, we'll see more leg wegs as we move on, but uh, this is one example of what wegs look like. The idea behind wegs is if they are designed properly, they should combine the best properties of legs and the best properties of wheels. And you can kind of see that demonstrated in this video. What are the advantages of wheels and the advantages of legs that WEGS try to integrate, try to combine? Uh, wheels have simple actuators, the motor, one motor that spins in circle continuously or reversing direction. Yep. But legs can walk over obstacles. I mean, I mean, terrain, at least it's designed properly, otherwise it is. Even harder to get over Exa exactly, right? So as you mentioned, wheels are simple, but they're not good at getting over stuff. Legs are good at getting over stuff, but they're complicated, right? So can you design a wegged machine uh, that combines those? So that was 
what the student was proposing. And to demonstrate the utility of the WEGS, you may not be able to read this from the back, but you can click on the link and have a look yourself. Um, they asked the question, can a WEGED robot outcompete a similar wheeled robot and a similar legged robot? So in this case, they ended up doing three sets, <coughs> three sets of evolutionary trials, one evolving controllers for legged robots, one evolving controllers for wheeled robots, and a third set of evolutionary trials that were evolving controllers for wagged robots. Each of those three evolutionary trials ran for the same number of generations, so all three sets of trials had about the same amount of computational effort. And in this case, the student was able to demonstrate that the wagged robots at the end were able to travel further than either the wheeled or the legged robots, which was the evidence they showed that there is a, an advantage to WEGS. So that was what they proposed, and then here's how they proposed to break this down. So after they had sketched this out in weekly report two, they proposed that they would change the quadruped, which is what you end up with at the end of assignment 10. They were gonna spend the second week changing that quadruped into a wagged robot. Then they were going to put a switch in their code where if you set that switch in the code to 0, 1, or 2, it would evolve controllers for either the wheeled, legged, or wagged robot. So their code could easily switch back and forth between these three morphologies. Second weekly, uh, third weekly report, sorry, fourth weekly report, uh, they put in rugged terrain. Uh, demonstrate a terrain in which the wagged robot does better than wheeled and legged and so on, right? That's, that's kind of what we're looking for in weekly report one. You have a good idea. It's something that's reasonable for the graduate students to do in eight, eight weeks, or for the undergrads when you get there that it's doable in three weeks, and that you got a plan to implement that. So they proposed in weekly report one, change the quadruped into a wagged robot. The next week, they resubmitted the link to this spreadsheet, and when we clicked on the second tab, the student had changed the quadruped into a wagged robot and had a video for us demonstrating that that was true. In the third week, and if you will flip back and forth between the tab here so you can see it, they changed what they had proposed for the third week. They originally proposed demonstrate a robot operating in any of these three configurations. They had to change the deliverable because of the changed WEG design. So the idea here is you are free to change your, your weekly reports. You're not locking yourself out. You're not locking yourself in to a plan in week one. If you need to make changes along the way, by all means do so. And we should be able to see that change by clicking on one weekly report or the next and give us a rationale for why. Obviously, when you have a plan in mind and you sketch out the next seven weeks, once you get into the reality of it, things might look very different, differently. It's no problem to change your, your, your plan. Just let us know and give us a rationale why. So what we're really looking for in these, or what the teaching assistant will be looking for in these weekly reports is that you have a good plan, you're implementing that, that plan. When you change it, you let us know why, it seems reasonable, and that you've got images and video along the way to demonstrate that you are implementing your way towards your final project. That's what we're looking for. Make sense? Any questions about that? Okay, so back to our discussion of the history, uh, brief history of evolutionary robotics. We finished last time with our discussion of minimal cognition, and we ended with the anthropomorphic robot that exhibits active categorical perception, not really minimal anyway, uh, anymore, but demonstrating the early goal of this branch of evolutionary robotics, which was start simple and see whether we can start to build up increasingly complex robots that are capable of more challenging behaviors. We're now gonna switch and spend two lectures talking about a different early branch in evolutionary robotics where the focus was not on categorical perception or selective attention or self, non-self discrimination. It was movement. There's an old uh, question in, uh, in neuroscience, which is why don't plants have brains? And I've kind of stolen my own punchline, right? Pl plants, generally speaking, do not need to self-displace. They do not need to move themselves from one place to the next. 
Plants are clearly very intelligent organisms, but they do not have nervous systems. So there is a very ancient relationship uh, in the biosphere between self-movement and cognition or intelligence. Right? The more you think about it, the more it seems reasonable. The moment you start to move, the world around you changes. For most of your sensorium, for most of your sense organs, they start to register global change when you're moving. And especially for the higher animals, there's a lot of visual change, and we rely pretty hev heavily on our visual sense. Despite the fact that everything around you is changing, you need to keep putting one foot in front of the other without stumbling, right? Man never enters the same river twice. Self-movement to us seems trivial, but thinking about thinking is mis misleading. Moving yourself from one place to the other is very, very challenging. It's one of the reasons why only recently have we been able to build walking machines and flying drones and so on. Most of the robots that we've had up until very recently stay put, right? They're industrial robots, they don't move. The Roomba is a notable exception, but the Roomba is a pretty simple creature, right? So not only is it difficult for organisms to move themselves from point A to point B, it's been very difficult for us to understand how organisms do that and build that into machines. So we're gonna look at a couple of studies uh, this week that looked at walking or moving machines. Okay, so uh, we're going to start again before we talk about machines, we're going to start with biology. And this is a screenshot from uh, one of my favorite books by uh, Professor Alexander. It's called The Principles of Animal Locomotion. I'll pass the book around. You can have a flip through it. Um, if you're interested in robotics, or biomechanics, which we're going to talk about today. This is the Bible uh, of that field. It's an amazing book. It w gradually walks through, no pun intended, every possible way that Mother Nature has discovered of getting organisms from point A to point B, or enabling them to move themselves from A to B. The book obviously starts with the only physiological mechanism that we all use to do so, which is muscle. In locomotion, one of the reasons that locomotion is difficult is for the reason I just mentioned, the moment you start moving, the world around you moves. The other thing that makes locomotion so difficult is that you are constantly striking a balance between at least four antagonistic phenomena. Displacement, so you want to move as far as possible, usually, but you have to do so at the cost of the other three. So robustness is the ability to move through different environments, right? If you can only locomote across perfectly flat ground, then your room to maneuver is pretty narrow. You also have to keep, uh, you also have to keep a, uh, a reckoning of energy. Obviously, the faster you move, the more energy you use. So there's another trade-off there. And finally, for most organisms and for most machines, you also need to keep upright as you move. Right? So we are trying to, or all organisms, strike slightly different trade-offs between these uh, four mechanisms. And again, all four of them are, are usually in opposition. Some of them are easier to see than others. The faster you move, the more energy you need to expend. What are some of the other antagonistic forces among these four uh, phenomena? Where does increasing one usually require a decrease in the other? Increasing is usually decreased uh, endurance. Uh, decreased endurance, yeah. Uh, endurance would usually be considered an energy here, right? Endurance is energy per distance traveled. What are some other trade-offs that you strike every day as you walk around campus? Stability and Stability and displacement, right? It's not as icy today. It was last week, right? That's, that's pretty important. The faster you move, generally speaking, the harder it is to maintain balance, especially when you take robustness into account if you're moving over ice, for example. Other examples? Absolutely, right? We have legs, and we just talked about legs and wigs and wheels. Legs are great because they let you get up and over stuff, so it increases our species' robustness in terms of travel over multiple terrains. 
but legged locomotion is energetically costly. We just talked about wheels, which are very simple. Legs cost energy because usually we have to pull them up with muscle, move them forward, and let them drop again. There's more energy usually required for legged locomotion than wheeled locomotion. Any others? We'll see more as we, as we continue. Okay, so uh, in this book, uh, he, uh, Alexander starts with some of the simplest ways of traveling over ground, like peristalsis. This is the idea of expanding and contracting part of your body. If you have a one-dimensional body plan, like a worm or a snake, peristalsis exists in lots of places in nature. It's the mechanism you use to swallow your food. Same principle there, not being used for locomotion. Mother Nature discovered it very, very early on in creatures that creep and crawl on or in the earth. And it's been exapted or adapted by Mother Nature for lots of other purposes. Then the ones that we are more familiar with, walking, running, and hopping, climbing and jumping. I showed you, I think last month, a brachiating robot using your arms to, locom uh, to displace from one point to another, crawling and burrowing, gliding and soaring, hovering, powered forward flight, uh, flapping wings, moving across the surface of the water if you're very small, swimming with oars and hydrofoils, undulation, and finally swimming with jet propulsion. If you think about all the different ways in which organisms or animals are able to, to move themselves, there is a staggering amount of diversity out there. And again, one of the reasons why is depending on the environmental niche, there, it is useful to strike a particular balance between these four competing forces. Let's just take one example of this trade-off in action. Let's look at uh, lizards and reptiles and snakes, which obviously tend to move, keeping their center of mass relatively low to the ground. What is so useful about that strategy and what is not so useful about that strategy? Mammals, including us, do not move by sliding along the surface across which we're moving. What are some of the advantages and disadvantages of the ways in which reptiles move? You don't have to hold yourself up. You don't have to hold yourself up, right? So there is some energy gain here. It's very easy to balance. It's very easy to balance, right? So stability is basically not even a consideration anymore. Don't have to worry about it. Less front-facing resistance. Less, what do you mean by front-facing resistance? Okay, yep. Yeah. There's more cross-section for us, absolutely. So moving into a forward force like wind, good point. So lots of advantages to staying close to the ground. But what are the disadvantages? Our mammalian ancestors found a different ecological niche and moving in a different way, where our legs are more vertical relative to the ground plane that we're moving over. What is the advantage of that over reptilian locomotion? Uh, speed. Speed. Why speed? Reptiles can move pretty fast too, but... I think it's a combination of speed and robustness. It's hard to weather over like a boulder field. Okay. If you have legs, you can kind of step over small gaps. Uh, absolutely. So there's something about robustness here, right? Once you're up on vertical legs, you can, you can sort of step over literally and, fi and figuratively a lot of the details or the difficult parts of the terrain. So there's an advantage in terms of robustness. That's true. Can Sorry? Can we can, absolutely. So of course, locomotion is connected with lots of other things. And we're going to keep restrict our discussion today to just to locomotion and the trade-offs within the mode of locomotion. Absolutely, the moment that you stand up on your hind limbs, your forelimbs become available for other things. We're going to set that aside for the moment. I don't know a lot of the biomechanics for it behind it, but isn't it more energy efficient sometimes to use legs because you're kind of using the leg weight? Absolutely. So there is a huge energetic uh, advantage to moving with legs that are vertical relative to the ground than horizontal. 
If you think about it, and you can try this at home if you want, lie on the ground and try and slide yourself on your belly across the ground. We all did that when we were very, very young, so we don't have to worry about the stability problem, but it's exhausting, right? We lose, you lose a lot of energy, depending on how fast you're moving, you lose it as, at heat. It is an extremely energetically inefficient way to do things. Now, to the credit of reptiles, they don't all drag their bellies across the ground. Some of them get their, their bellies off the ground a little bit by bending their by bending their uh, elbows or shoulders, which then opens up this idea of being able to move over ground. And the more and more vertical your legs become, why does it become more energy uh, efficient? The moment you get your belly off the ground, that makes sense. You're not losing a lot of energy. But after that point, there is a further energetic benefit to having more and more vertical legs. Anybody know? Right, so there's less parts of your body that are touching the ground. So let's put friction aside. What is it about vertical legs that's so useful? Um, you're not, I, I don't really know how to explain it, but like you're not, you're not just working this up and out, you're just working this under you. Absolutely, right? So all of your weight is over your leg. That is also useful, but there's w one other factor that swamps everything else. You can let gravity do some of the work for you. We're gonna to spend today talking about legged locomotion and Thursday we'll talk about bipedal locomotion. Before we get there though, you can try this yourself. As you're walking around campus today, try and pay attention to the major muscle groups in your legs and which ones are tensed at which moment during your stride. What you will notice is that uh, in your stance leg, which is the leg that is holding your weight at any given time, obviously you're tensing your muscles or else you'll fall. But the moment your leg leaves the ground, all of the muscles in your leg go limp and your leg starts to act like a pendulum. You let gravity do all the work for you. And instead of you tensing your muscles and pushing your leg forward, gravity will do it for you. And during that half stride that your leg is swinging, that leg is resting. The moment it hits the ground, it starts working again, relaxing, working, relaxing. So for any single leg in a bipedal walker, its leg is resting 50% of the time. If you are trying to hold your belly off the ground with mostly horizontal legs, you don't get that that benefit, right? So there is a huge energetic benefit to vertically oriented legs, right? That is just one example of a way in which Mother Nature uh, struck a better balance between these four considerations. Okay, of course, g gaining so much energy through bipedal locomotion, you also incur other costs like stability, right? Now we have to deal with stability where reptiles never do. Okay, okay. So uh, let's, I, we're going to look at a few figures that were taken from Alexander's book that show, uh, give you just a sort of snapshot into the field of biomechanics and how we've spent a long time trying to understand how animals strike different balances between speed, energy, robustness, and stability. You can, with the invention of treadmills, you can put an animal on, on the treadmill and you can try and record the change in oxygen consumption, we won't talk about that too much today. Depending on the animal, including humans, you get them to wear a mask or you put them uh, in a cage that's very carefully ventilated. Generally speaking, the faster the treadmill moves, the faster the animal moves to compensate and the more oxygen the organism consumes and the amount of oxygen consumed is a good proxy for the amount of energy being expended for that movement, yeah? Okay, we're not gonna spend too much time talking about that, but that's basically how it works. Once we start to do those kinds of studies, we can actually measure and plot how this trade-off between, in this case, speed and energy changes as a function of gait. So here's some data collected, not from a cat or a hedgehog, but from humans. Let's have a look at this panel here. The horizontal axis, we have speed, so if you put a human on the treadmill, 
and you slowly turn up the speed of the treadmill, not surprisingly, between zero and about two meters per second, they will walk, but at some point they will switch to a running gait. Why? Again, you can try this at home. I don't recommend it. You can try turning up your treadmill faster and faster and restrict yourself to walking. It's not a comfortable exercise. Not quite keep the balance. You can actually keep your balance if you're good at walking at very high speeds. It's not a matter of stability. Well, when you run, you almost bounce off your feet. So like when you're traveling at much higher speeds, you can kind of use that momentum to keep yourself propelled. You can, exactly. So there's some tricks that your body is using when you run. And it's using those tricks not just to maintain stability, but to do something else, which is hinted at by this figure. What is it? much more efficient, right? So if you look at the left, if you look at this curve here, this is for walking. Obviously, if you want to move slowly, walking is very efficient for the reason we just mentioned. Half, half of the time your leg is resting. But as the speed at which you want to travel speeds up, it becomes more and more difficult to do that. We don't have time for energy and momentum to swing our legs forward because we want to move at a certain speed. So we have to start tensing the swing leg, the leg that's not in contact uh, with the ground. And the, that trade-off becomes worse and worse for faster speeds. The faster we want to start moving, the more and more energy we have to use to the point where it doesn't make sense anymore and we should switch to a completely different way of walking, which adds yet another twist to our conversation about locomotion. Now we are not just trying to strike a balance between these four conditions, we are also trying to strike a balance between these for a certain speed and a certain gait. So this concept of gait arises in legged organisms, and one of the magical and interesting things about gates is they strike different balances between the four considerations we've discussed so far. Yeah. You can see it in other ways. So in this experiment here, they put humans on a treadmill, um, and they, uh, they kept the treadmill running at one meter per second, so the treadmill stayed the same speed, but they asked uh, they asked the subjects to take small, fast steps, which would be out here, or very long, slow strides. So to change the way in which you walk on the same speed treadmill, what happened? What did they learn in this case? Not quite. No, the smaller steps are out, are out here. So this is high frequency, small steps. These are low frequency, long strides. There's kind of a natural stride that seems to be best suited for people at a certain speed. There's a natural, there's a natural frequency here. Natural in the sense that at one hertz, so at about one footfall per second, the humans spent the least amount of energy on this treadmill. Remember, the treadmill was always moving at the same speed, and we're watching to see how much energy a human is using to stay stationary on that treadmill at that speed. And depending on how you walk, it requires more or less energy. And for most people, again, it depends uh, on your gender, level of physical fitness, uh, your height, your weight. But generally speaking, for humans, it averages out, for adult humans, it averages out at about one hertz. Again, as you walk around campus today, see if you can keep a metronome going in your head and get a feeling for the frequency at which you most naturally walk, assuming you're not rushing to, to your next class. When you walk at your natural speed, how, what is the frequency of your gait? Most of you will probably find it's about one hertz. Okay, so uh, let's talk about other legged organisms for a moment. We've already introduced the concept of gait, which is pretty natural. Um, as we move forward in our discussion today, we're gonna talk about stance and flight phase. So as the name implies, if we watch a legged uh, organism as it's moving, at every point during the stride, so a stride is whatever the animal does and returns to its initial configuration. So if I start with my left foot on the ground, right hits, 
The moment I get back to my left foot on the ground, I have completed one stride. Stance phase is a part of that stride in which at least one foot is in contact with the ground. Makes sense. And the flight phase is any fraction of, uh, of the uh, step when all legs are off the ground. Over a hundred years ago, people were curious about when a horse is trotting, whether there actually is a flight phase. I don't know if there's any horse people here, but if you go on YouTube and you watch a horse that's trotting, it's very difficult to spot whether uh, during that gait a horse ever brings all four feet off the ground. The very initial, uh, the, the very first movie that was ever made was made of a horse trotting, with the idea being if you made this moving picture, you could stop the moving picture at a certain frame and see whether there was a flight phase, and in fact, there, there was. So it's sort of an interesting history about photography and, and locomotion. Okay. Uh, I found this video a few weeks back on YouTube, which is a great example of the differences in gates and the differences in flight and stance phase. So for, uh, for most dogs, like a greyhound, as you can see here, there's usually about six gates. Which of these six gates involves a flight phase? Play it a couple times. The last two, canter and gallop. Yep, canter and gallop for sure. Trot? Probably not. Kind of hard to see, right? And again, it depends on the animal. It can trot a little bit faster, a little bit slower. What is the advantage of spending more time in the air than on the ground? What is the advantage of these gates over these gates? It's an obvious one. One is, allows you to move faster than the other. Less friction, on the Less friction on the ground. Now, typically, for most walking animals, there isn't much friction. So you, your foot, or your paw pad in this case, is not actually moving relative to the ground, so you're not generating or losing energy through heat, through sliding, but there is a bit of a friction consideration here. Okay, so other terms we're gonna use, other, uh, other terminology we're gonna use in our discussion of moving animals and eventually moving robots is static and dynamic stability. Static stability is the idea that if at any point in time the animal or the robot stops moving, it becomes static, it is stable. In a lot of niches, that makes sense. If you're moving yourself and at any time you might need to stop, you obviously don't want to fall down. So a gait that is statically stable means that at any given time, if you stop moving, you don't fall over. There are certain gaits that are not statically stable, meaning if the animal or the machine stops at that point in time, you're not going to maintain your balance. What are some examples of gaits for, what's, for which that's true? If you think of like a dog galloping and then they like try and stop and they like slide and like hit against the wall. Absolutely. It's not going to work very well, right? If you are running at your top speed and you mo immediately become motionless, things are not going to end well for you, right? So statically stable, st static stability has advantages, as you can imagine, but we give up that advantage the moment that we want to travel faster, right? This trade-off between, in this case, speed and stability. Nothing to do with energy or robustness. Dynamic stability is kind of interesting. This is the case where the animal or the machine falls into a rhythmic pattern, and any perturbation to that pattern, the system will naturally return to that rhythm again. Can you think of some examples from nature of uh, gates or behaviors that are dynamically stable? Any external perturbation to the animal and the animal returns to what it's doing? Maybe a bird flying and there's a wind or a camel that shows up. Okay, possibly. Now, in most cases, so for example, if a bird is flying and there's a puff of wind, it adapts. We can adapt actively. Are there cases where the organism doesn't even need to quote unquote think about it? It just naturally returns to what it's doing. It's a little bit more difficult. Okay. 
Yes, and I wish I had the video here. A fish is a great example. There's a great video uh, that shows a fish that's in, uh, it's in a plastic tube, and there is a flow of water going through the tube, and the fish is swimming against the current and basically stays in place in the tube. Has anybody seen this video and know what the punchline is? What's that? No, it's a real fish, not a cartoon. I'll find the video for next time. The fish is dead. The, fish, the shape of a fish body is so hydrodynamic that, again, it depends on the species. You put a dead fish in a flow and it will actually, quote unquote, swim against the current. It is dynamically stable. Thanks for the example of a fish. That's a great, great example. All right, I'll bring the video next time, right? Again, you can imagine there is a great selective advantage to letting nature do the work for you, or in this case, the shape of the body do the work for you, or in our case, as bipeds, letting gravity do the work for you. These are all examples of, again, this concept of embodied cognition, which we introduced the first week of the semester. Right? The body is not an obstruction to intelligent action. It can be a tool. It can help intelligent action, make it easier. Okay. Um, in order to determine whether something is statically stable or dynamically stable, in the case of legged robots or animals, we can look at their polygon of support at any given time. So let's, let's take the horse, a four-legged animal, as an example. Let's imagine that we're looking at this horse from above and that we are able to see from above exactly where the feet land on the ground at a given instant in time. In this cartoon example here, the left foot, left back, and right back foot are in the, on the ground, and the right front foot is off the ground. If we take the points of contact and we draw a polygon around those points, that is the polygon of support. Imagine that in this cartoon example, the horse's center of mass is uh, sitting over this polygon of support. The center of mass of the horse obviously is centered somewhere in three-dimensional space off the ground, but if we project that three-dimensional position down onto the ground, and that center of mass, that point, is sitting inside the polygon of support. We'll also make one more simplifying assumption. Assume the horse is not moving at the moment, so there is no forward momentum. Is the horse stable at this point, or is it going to fall over? It's stable, right? If you think of this center of mass as sort of pulling the horse down, it is pulling it down inside this tent of support through these three struts, the three legs that are in contact with the ground. If the horse had its center of mass slightly forward of the polygon of support, and if it didn't compensate, it would fall forward. So at this point, it is statically stable. Let's think about us for a moment. Let's think about walking for a moment. Walking at a slow, natural gait. Tell me about your polygon of support as you're walking naturally. What does that polygon of support look like on the ground if we were to draw it as you were walking? That, that's the center of mass. So the center of mass, generally speaking, stays between your two feet. Forget center of mass for a moment. What about polygon of support? Where and when do your feet hit? And if we were to draw polygons around those points for each instant in time. So imagine we're drawing multiple polygons, one for every instant of time as you're walking. What do those polygons look like? Sorry? They increase and decrease, right? Why? What's happening? Absolutely, yep. And then once you Absolutely, right? So at any given time, the polygon looks like one of your feet because only one foot is in contact with the ground. The other one is your flight foot at that point. So the polygon of support is just your foot. 
And the moment both feet are in contact with the ground, you're drawing a polygon around both of your feet. So it is shrinking and growing over time, which means that Strictly speaking, we aren't always statically stable as we're walking. Most of the time, when both feet are on the ground, as you mentioned, your center of mass is over both feet, and you're pretty stable. You can stop at that moment and do whatever you need to do, and then continue moving. But at the moment in which you, your uh, one foot is on the ground, your center of mass may be close to your foot, but probably not directly over it. And again, it takes a little bit of work to stay uh, upright with just one foot on the ground, right? So we're slightly more or less statically stable as we walk, definitely not statically stable as we run, right? Okay, so let's take these, let's take these concepts and now uh, view them through the lens of robots and we'll look at what a now very famous robot. Everybody's seen Big Dog before. Statically stable, dynamically stable. Oops, I guess I can't pause that. If we were to if we were to stop uh, if we were to stop if we were to stop Big Dog at any time there, would it fall over? Is it statically stable? I see one yes and a couple of couple of no's. It's again a little difficult to see. You probably can't hear it because I have the audio very low, but there's a buzzing going on from Big Dog. Anybody know why? So it's got a diesel engine on board. This is not an electric machine. Big Dog is carrying 325 pounds at, in this video. Here's an example of dynamic stability. Now in this case, Big Dog is actively compensating for the external perturbation. Imagine you're carrying 325 pounds on your back and somebody does that to you. It's probably not gonna end well for you. So Big Dog is pretty robust. So it's exhibiting more or less the same gait, but in very, very different environments. You can see it actively compensating for, again, ex these small, continuous external perturbations. Imagine you're carrying 325 pounds on your back and you slip on the ice. Again, not, not going to end well for you, right? Okay, it took us a long, long time. So Big Dog was, uh, this video is from 2006. It took us a long time from the first robot back around the Second World War till just recently to figure out how to get this to work. Legged locomotion is an extremely difficult task to get right in robotics. Some of you may have seen this video before. How many have seen the sequel, Big Dog version two? or Big Dog Beta, I'm sorry. What was the innovation here? Yes. Legged locomotion is difficult, so let's get rid of the machines and go back to the, the machines that are really good at legged locomotion. Okay. You know you've made it in robotics when somebody makes a spoof video of your, uh, your robot. Okay. That's, that's big dog beta there. Okay. So this is work from uh, Boston Dynamics, and they've made a lot of progress since, since big dog, but we'll just focus on, uh, on big dog today. Okay. Back to animals for a moment, and then we'll go back to robotics. Just one more example of animals striking a balance between speed and energetic cost. In this case, we're looking at uh, ponies, which left to their own devices will periodically walk, trot, and gallop. 
And when they do so, they walk at about this speed on average. They trot on average at about this speed and gallop at about this speed. If you then take ponies and put them on a very large treadmill and reward them when, the, when they exhibit a particular gait at a particular speed on the treadmill, you can train them or teach them to exhibit these gaits even at speeds other than the one that they're most uh, comfortable walking at. So for example, if we take, take trot here, if you set the treadmill to about three meters per second, they will naturally trot. If you start to turn up, if you start to turn up the speed of the treadmill, left to their own devices, they will naturally switch to a galloping gait, like humans will naturally switch to running at a certain speed. But if you reward them, they will resist the temptation to gallop and will continue trotting at a faster and faster uh, treadmill speed. What happens? Energy usage goes up. Energy usage goes up and by doing this, we can see that at certain speeds, for example, five meters per second, you can now really see that galloping is actually less costly than trotting very quickly at the same speed. So just another example of this trade-off between uh, speed and energy. Okay, let's switch back to robotics. We're actually look at uh, some figures from a paper uh, I published a number of years ago uh, with Rolf Pfeiffer where we looked at this, we tried to look at this trade-off, but we wanted to view this trade-off through the lens of morphology or body plans. So we looked in this study at 10 different simulated robots. Um, as we just saw in the animal studies, different animals have different ways of moving, and even among higher animals that have vertically oriented legs, there are different gates depending on the organism. So our species has two gates that we tend to like to move at. How many gates do horses have? We saw a few examples already. More than three. Any horse people here? So for more, most horses, there are five gates. There is a species of Icelandic horse that exhibits a sixth gate called tolting. And again, go and have a look on YouTube. It looks very unnatural. It's not something that we're used to. Where do these gates come from? Why do at least this bipedal species have two gates, but another animal with a different body plan, why does it have different numbers of gates that strike different energetic balances between speed and energy? The answer, of course, is it's, it's complicated. Part of it has to do with the fact that, depending on your morphology, you're able to exploit gravity and momentum and friction and turn them to your advantage. So what we wanted to look at in this study is to see whether we could start to tease apart the relationships between morphology and the striking of balances between speed and, and energy. Okay, so how did we do this? Well, we came up with 10 different robots, but we tried to keep, uh, aside from the body plan, we tried to keep everything else about the robots the same. If you squint at the picture at the top, you'll see that every, uh, every robot has four T's, which are four touch sensors. Every robot also has four A's, which are four angle sensors. And every robot also has eight M's, which are eight motorized joints. So although all the robots have different body plans, they all have exactly the same numbers of sensors and motors, which allows us to create exactly the same neural network architecture for all of them. So all 10 of these robots inside, they have this neural network controller. The input layer is receiving signals from the four touch sensors, the four angle sensors, and a ninth bias neuron have we talked about bias neurons already? A bias neuron outputs uh, a constant value, in this case, plus one. The reason why a bias neuron is useful is imagine at some point in time that this robot uh, experiences all zeros. All of the sensors are reporting zeros. That means that no matter what the weights of the synapses are flowing into the hidden layer, the hidden layer cannot help but have zero values, right? Zero times W, anything is zero. 
Let's discount the recurrent connections for a moment. Basically, what a bias neuron does in a moving robot is allow it to still do things with the motors, even if it's not registering anything on the sensors. Without a bias neuron, if, if all of the sensors go dark, the robot will immediately stop moving, which is not necessarily, not often a good thing to do. Okay. Eight sensors, in this case we had three hidden neurons. We see that there are recurrent connections which remind us that that enables the robot to remember things, if that's useful. And values are flowing out to the eight motors. And I forget the actual count, but there's on the order of about 100 synapses here. We're back to a more traditional neural network. This is not a CTRNN. There's no tau's, no gains, no uh, offsets or biases. We're just going to evolve these 100 weights. We're going to evolve uh, these 100 weights on this robot, then evolve the 100 weights on this robot, this one, this one, this one, and we're all going to evolve them for the same number of generations. So we're going to expend the same amount of computational effort evolving uh, neural networks for these 10 robots, and we want to see which one is able to travel the furthest at the end of evolution. Which one is it easier, which body plan is it easier for the evolutionary algorithm to evolve fast moving gates for? One final detail, you can notice these robots are all oriented so they're pointing up and into the screen. So we're going to select for forward locomotion along the uh, long axis of the robot. Okay, we're not going to do any actual gambling in this class, but which one do you think is more amenable to evolution of fast locomotion here. Given what we've talked about today and given some of the things we've talked about previously in this course. For some of you, it might be easier to think about the opposite question. Which body plan here is going to be particularly difficult for evolution to produce fast moving gates for? 6 seems difficult, okay? Why? It's not natural. It's not natural. So, so some of these body plans we picked obviously so they look somewhat familiar, right? There's some reptiles in here and some vaguely mammalian forms in here and some are less natural. Maybe that matters, maybe it doesn't. Okay, I'm going to force you to place your bets. Who votes for number one as the most likely to move quickly? Any takers? Two, hands up. Couple, three. Okay, some of you that have got to the later assignments, you're working with robot three, so maybe that's a pretty strong hint that maybe this is a good candidate. Four, the reptile, right? Dragging its belly along the ground might be difficult. How about uh, the snake, number five? I got okay, one vote. Number six, no, no taker, seven. So it's a snake with legs, kind of an odd choice. Okay, how about eight or nine, eight? No, nine, nine, okay, a few votes for nine. How about 10, the tripod? Okay, all right. The anthropomorphic bias, right? The one that looks most like us, obviously, must be the one to go. Okay. Before I show you the answer, let's take a, a stop partway along. What you're looking at here are 10 different footprint graphs, and a footprint graph is a way to try and represent the shape of a gate or the, the, the mechanism of a gate in a single image without having to show a video, right? For many of you in your final project, if you're evolving any, any robot that has legs on it and you want to try and communicate to us how it's moving, footprint graph is a good way to go. So this might be a useful visualization. Let's take uh, robot number one, which you see down here. Uh, as you can imagine, robot one has four points of contact that are possible with the ground. So as this robot evolves the ability to move quickly, the polygons of support that it may produce are a single point. If one foot is in contact with the ground, a line. If the two diagonally opposing uh, 
legs are in contact with the ground, a triangle for all three legs, and uh, a rectangle for the four legs. You'll notice that the footprint graph for robot one, oh, I'm sorry, what I'm showing in the footprint graph is the best evolved controller that we found for robot one. You'll notice that in panel one, there are four rows, which correspond to the four possible points of contact. And the columns represent the 500 time steps that elapsed in the simulator when that controller is controlling that robot. A black pixel indicates that that foot was in contact with the ground at that time, and a white pixel indicates that that foot was off the ground at that time. Tell me about this robot's gait. I'm intentionally not showing you the video. Can you mentally reconstruct how robot one was moving when controlled by this best evolved controller that we found for robot one? Not quite. So I haven't told you what foot corresponds to what, what row. So even without that information, what can you tell me about this robot? It looks like at the very least two of the feet move at the same time. Two of the feet are moving more or less at the same time, and the other two feet are also somewhat moving at the same time. So this could be bounding, which you often see dogs moving that are moving quickly. Both front feet and both back feet move together. This is definitely not pronking, which is all four feet going at the same time, which mountain goats tend to exhibit. Does anybody remember Pepe Le Pew from the old Looney Tunes cartoons? Again, something if you haven't seen it, it's worth going back and watching. That's pronking, all four feet going at the same time. This robot is definitely not pronking. What else can you tell me about this evolved controller? Is it optimal? Is this robot moving as quickly as it possibly could? One of the things about footprint graphs is it's not actually telling you anything about the distance traveled by this robot, right? Just when particular points of contact come in contact with the ground. This robot could, in theory, be landing pairs of feet at the same time but staying in place. Definitely not optimal. There's another hint in panel one that tells you that this is definitely not an optimal gait. What is it? Um, there's two or three um, parts that are on the ground for a time period of time. Uh, th that's true. So there are feet that are in contact for relatively long periods of time. You would expect a very fast moving robot one for feet to just be touching the ground for very short periods of time. Yep, that is another hint. It's really like the same two like pairs, like right after another, so yep. it would be like almost bouncing. Yep, possibly. It's not necessarily a good or bad thing. Yep. Uh, it takes a while to repeat. It takes a while to repeat. Yeah, exactly. So maybe it's a long stride, which again is not necessarily a bad thing. There's some inconsistence, right? So the pattern isn't perfectly repeating. If you look at the Evolve controller for Robot 2, the pattern is much cleaner, right? So what does that mean? What do these outliers mean? If you were to watch the video of Robot 1 compared to Robot 2, what would be the difference? It would definitely be inconsistent, not all for four persons in the second position. Yeah. Which is not stable. That's true. Stumbled, right? So it's limping and it's stumbling. You can immediately look at a footprint graph and know how clean the gait is, right? How much or how little irregularities and stumbling there is. What's the problem with stumbling, given our discussion about locomotion? Why does stumbling immediately tell you this is not ideal? Again, it seems kind of so obvious to us. What is it about stumbling that's such a problem? Energy, because you, you've got to recover from the stumble. And typically when you're stumbling, you're also losing speed, right? You not only have to recover the gait, but you've got to recover your momentum and speed back up again. Once you, quote unquote, get in the rhythm 
of a fast moving gate like a run and it's clean, you're saving a little bit of energy, right? You're, mo you're maintaining your momentum and your forward momentum is doing a lot of the work, the energetic work for you. Okay. Anybody want to revise their bets looking at all 10 panels here? Again, footprint graphs do not tell you which of these 10 moved further. Which of these robots is having, uh, having a problem? Which robots is it more difficult for evolution to find a good gate for? Five doesn't look very good, why not? What's happening to five? There's no consistent, it's, it's sort of all stumbling, right? And here's number five here. Seven's a little bit better, but also pretty messy. Here's seven. What's going on here? Okay, move on to the second last video here. Let's look at some of the actual gates. This is the best evolved gate for robot six, the hexapod. Again, this was work we did quite a while ago, so I apologize for the video quality. Okay, definitely probably not optimal. <laughs> Here's one of the quadrupeds. Remember we saw from the footprint graph that two legs were moving to in phase and the two pairs of legs are moving in anti phase. It's not quite bounding, but a pretty good gait. Here's a uh, robot seven, one of the snake robots, which as we saw in the footprint graph had a pretty uh, dirty footprint graph, right? A lot of stumbling. What would a clean gate for this robot look like? Caterpillar, which moves how? What do you see in a, in a caterpillar that's moving well? It's like front to back, right? They're gonna do like one at a time, basically. Front to back, right? You have this traveling wave that moves from the head to the back, which tends to produce clean forward locomotion, which is a form of peristalsis, which we talked about at the beginning of this, this lecture, right? Doing some simple movement, that travels anterior front to posterior back. It also, in some cases, works the other way. This uh, robot definitely does not exhibit clean peristalsis. And finally, let's have a look at the triped, which is, in this study, the closest to us. We didn't actually look at bipeds. Anybody ever walked with crutches before? Why is it so difficult to evolve controllers for the tripod compared to the hexapod or the quadruped? It's a lot less stable. Why does it take most of us two, three, four, five years to figure out how to do it when we're very young? It is not trivial. There is a very harsh antagonism between stability and displacement when you have less than four legs. But there is an advantage, which we just talked about, the energetic cost of moving with three or fewer legs. It's much, uh, much lower than the energetic cost of moving with four legs or more. In this simplified study, we weren't actually looking at energetic cost, just speed. We just wanted to know which body plans were more difficult or easier to evolve fast moving controllers for. Okay. Here's the final uh, slide in this sequence. Here's uh, evolutionary time on the horizontal axis. Vertical axis is fitness, which is displacement or speed. And you can see 10 curves, which correspond to the average speed during evolution for these 10 robots. You can see in this case that actually six ended up winning right at the end. So six, two, and three 
it was relatively easy for evolution to evolve control, fast moving controllers for these three robots compared to this group down here and then the laggards robots five and seven. So six, two, and three correspond to, here we go, six, six, two, and three. Why did six, two, and three win? Uh, four more legs, yeah. One also has four legs. Can not immediately clear why why one had such a problem? Yep. So, so yeah, exactly. So it's six, two, and three have knees. So maybe that helps. They all have like vertical facing legs. They all have vertical facing legs. Maybe that helps. Now, as far as we know in our discussion so far, vertical legs sort of help for uh, energy uh, for uh, energy minimization, which isn't a consideration here, but maybe there's something about having hooked legs that makes these a little more stable than this. Hard to say from this picture. Why did five, maybe an easier question to answer, why did five and seven do so poorly? I feel like there might have just been like too many limbs. There's too many limbs, right? So they all have exactly this controller, but it seems that evolving this controller, given four touch, uh, four pieces of touch information and four pieces of angle information at every time step. It's much harder for evolution to produce peristaltic motion in these robots. Again, why it's not immediately clear, maybe it's just there's too many moving parts to, to coordinate. The answer to all of those questions is, as usual with locomotion, it's complicated, right? There is no simple answer. So we did a little bit of analysis to try and answer that question, which was we now have a number associated with each of these 10 robots, which is this number, how, f how fast they moved at the end of some fixed period of evolution. Can we take these numbers, these winners and losers, and see whether those numbers correlate with some other feature of the robot? Yeah. Okay, first thing we did, the first thing we could think of was the total mass of the robot. We haven't really talked about mass yet. In all of these robots, in all of these robots, every single object that makes up the robot is one kilogram or one unit of mass in the physics engine. So obviously some of these robots are made up of more parts than others, so they are heavier than others. Sometimes mass can be a useful thing because once you get a heavy mass moving, it has more momentum. But obviously, to get that heavier mass moving requires some more motion to get it going. You'll notice that uh, on the horizontal axis here, we've ordered the 10 robots from lightest to heaviest. And the hexapod number six is the heaviest, made up of the most number of parts. And the vertical axis here is this average performance, these 10 numbers that we took here. You can see that generally, as the robots get heavier, it's harder for evolution to evolve fast moving gates for them. But the three winners are notable exceptions to that trend. So whatever the answer is, it's not just about mass. It's not simply that heavier robots are harder to evolve movement for. So we've been talking about number of points of contact, how many or how few legs they have. So we took, again, our 10 robots and rearranged them now by the number of points of contact that were possible with the ground. Here's the biped over here that could touch with its three feet, and the two worm robots over here that had a total of 10 possible points of contact. And we get this picture, which again, it's not really clear, but suggests that maybe that something in the middle makes sense. Too many legs and it's hard for evolution to orchestrate their movement. Too few legs and there are stability issues. So something in between maybe makes sense. Last thing we looked at in this study was how do changes in the brains of these robots help or hinder evolution's ability to evolve fast-moving gates for them. 
So again, we've got our 10 robots organized down here from robot number one to robot number 10. The light colored bars are the average performance that I just showed you. And these are average performance using the neural network in its original form with three hidden neurons, this picture here. We then re-evolved all 10 robots with a bigger brain where we had exactly the same neural network architecture, but we added in two additional hidden neurons. If you remember back to our discussion about neural networks, adding hidden neurons can help a neural network by allowing it to compute functions that would have been difficult or impossible for a smaller neural network to compute. You looked, at the, you looked at a neural network that computes the OR function and another one that computes the AND function. And without a hidden layer, without enough neurons in the hidden layer, there was no set of weights that would get that neural network to compute the XOR function. The only way to get those simple neural networks to compute the XOR function was to add an additional hidden neuron. So one aspect of gait or moving quickly is obviously transforming your incoming sensory information into commands to the motor. Maybe that transformation for some of these robots needs to be more complicated. If that's true, you would expect that giving them a bigger brain and evolving that bigger brain would allow those robots to move faster. Given this picture, did that happen? Generally, yes, right? So the robots with the bigger brains and the same amount of computational effort, we redid evolution, they traveled faster, that's true. Some of these robots benefited more from bigger brains than others. Which ones? Six, maybe, benefited about 20%, traveled about 20% more than before. This bar is about one-fifth higher. Seven definitely, made a big difference. seven definitely made a difference, right? So the robot number seven is moving more than twice as fast with the bigger brains than it did with the smaller brains. More or less the same with number five. So the ones that were doing the worst before, five and seven, five and seven, benefited the most from the additional hidden neurons which suggests this idea that they need to coordinate their legs, they got a lot of moving parts, and that additional neural real estate helped evolution to figure out how to orchestrate those additional legs. That may or may not be true, all we know is that bigger brains helped. What we, what we took away from this study, when we finished it, is that again, locomotion is extremely difficult. It is not just a trade-off between stability, robustness, speed and energy, all, the, all those trade-offs are influenced by the body plan of the robot and the amount of neural architecture, the amount of neural real estate that they have available to them. For some of these robots, bigger brains meant faster travel, right? If you look in nature, most of the organisms that need to move over land, which is particularly difficult to do, if you're swimming through the water or flying through the air, there are less obstacles. There's less environmental variability than if you are trying to travel over rough terrain. And most of the land animals, ourselves included, tend to have massive brains relative to our body mass, which is just another example of this intimate relationship between locomotion and uh, intelligence. Okay, any questions about that before we break for today? I think we'll stop here for today. You have a quiz due tonight. We'll talk about bipedal locomotion on Thursday. See you then.